another parent said. I didn't get no good information because they just sent, he brought a folder home and it had all these different schools, so I would have to just pick for myself. I didn't get no good information. Just sent me the papers and you just go for yourself. Another parent said, because you know back in the day, when like when I was in high school, the high schools used to come to the school and used to have like, like you know, like a day where a couple of high schools come and you fill out the applications. They didn't do that. They didn't do it like they used to do it. They did it totally different. No, it's like they don't care. To me, that's the way I see it. It's like, it's not like it used to be. Some of the charter high parents similarly feel like they were not given much information, but you can start to hear a little bit more feeling of control over the process. Not a lot more, but a little bit more. First charter high parent says, sounding more like the other ones, with CPS, the only thing they have is the high school fair. That's it. Whatever you do, whatever footwork, leg work, you on your own. You have to do it on your own. This is a theme, on your own, on your own. Whatever you decide, this is another parent, whatever you decide, what you choose, because you don't decide. You give it to the counselors and they, it's either, either they get in or they don't. This is that register part. <laughs> so everything, you on your own. Another parent says, no, I think you have to investigate for yourself and see information on your own. No one's going to throw it at you. That's the Chicago public school system. And then finally one parent says, because some parent, and this is, this is probably the efficacious model of a choosing parent. Because, because some parents don't know that they need to be educated. They take the school for its word and they're dependent on the school to give them information. And the Chicago Public Schools, at least the ones I've been exposed to, fail to offer that information. And not to knock them, as I said, some of the principals and counselors have a lack of knowledge and they don't know, and they do what they know. And they've been doing the same thing for so long that it's what they've become accustomed to. So at this point, I think that parents need to know that it is their responsibility to pay more attention to their child's education and research the schools and find out what's the best fit for their child because there are many options out there that aren't given. I thought that's an interesting way to end. There are many options out there that aren't given. So she recognized there is a choice field, but that she has to find that choice field because they aren't going to be given. To give a sense of um, how what parents use to make their choices, uh, here you see some of the differences in the resources that parents had. So you see differences between charter high and neighborhood high parents in the proportions of that of the internet, which is key since much of the research to find a school needs to be done over the internet. There is a very big, thick book that you can get at the high school's fair, and that's one good resource, but there's additional information on the internet. Um, more charter high school parents own cars which is especially important because the charter high, high schools have citywide admissions. So if you can't apply to all of these schools all over the city because you don't know if you can get your child there, having a car makes it much easier to go to the open houses to even fathom getting your child somewhere out of the neighborhood school. Uh, more likely to attend church, and this is, we argue, important for social networking, talking to other parents about what um, is available. Uh, have, more likely to have their child out in outside activities more likely to consider private school, uh, have a much more academic focus when they were looking for schools where the neighborhood high kids wanted to place that wasn't violent, that was high on safety, um, spent much more time on the decision, put in many more applications, and were much more likely to have visited the school before they enrolled their child. So some preliminary findings from the Chicago School Study is first parents who are in default options often think that they don't have a choice. And so it's not a choice, it's that they put me here. Number two, overall parents feel that they aren't given resources to help make a choice. This is true of the charter parents as well as the neighborhood parents. So if, at the very least, if one is going to be an advocate for a choice regime, one definitely needs to be an advocate for much, much more information. And in fact, last year, the Chicago Public Schools didn't even have its high school fair because of budget shortfalls. Um, parents in the choice option have greater personal resources to undertake a choice. They have cars, they have the internet, they have broader social networks as uh, assumed by church attendance and their kids and other activities. Parents in the choice option put forth greater effort in making a choice, so I don't want to make it a total structural story. They also put in more hours, put in many more applications. And parents in, parents in the default option are frustrated and distressed by this final outcome. So the level of frustration, the the it was very hard doing the interviews because many of the parents would say, what can I do now? You know, but this was the summer before the ninth grade year, and I knew there was nothing that they could do. There was little that they could do. 
um, but really begging for information, begging us for information. This was like we were somebody new that they hadn't seen on the scene and begging for information about schools. Um, so the next research project is motivated by the, is, is about housing and motivated a lot by the moving to opportunity research. So this is the research that I just mentioned that has found something like this in Chicago, where what they did is they gave people from public housing uh, a housing choice voucher. And they told some people you could move anywhere you wanted, and that's the control group here. And then they told the other group, the experimental group, you have to move into a low poverty neighborhood. Um, so they had restrictions on their voucher use. They had to move to a neighborhood that was under 10% poor. And where did they end up? This is, I think, seven years later. Cause, so this might be after a second move. They didn't end up in neighborhoods that were much different from one another. This is um, Rob, research by Rob Sampson. The darker colored neighborhoods here in Chicago are neighborhoods of concentrated disadvantage in the year 2000. This is where the control group ends up. And this is where the experimental end group ends up. So you, you see some more experimental group ends up here, but although these neighborhoods still have high levels of concentrated disadvantage. And you see few dots in neighborhoods that have low uh, levels of concentrated disadvantage. And so policymakers ask, what went wrong? Uh, and partially from this research, I would suggest that policymakers, this goes back to one of the assumptions, policymakers don't know what people are looking for. So um, what we did was we invited 200 recent Housing Choice Voucher movers and 200 people from the Housing Choice Voucher wait list to come do focus groups. It's a really short time schedule, so we really took the first people who said yes, they'd come. I mean, we had to do this like in four weeks because we had some quick funding. So we had uh, five focus groups with 22 people. This is pilot research, you guys. I'm not arguing that you should write your dissertation based on research after three weeks and 22 <laughs> 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 So. Um, don't, don't do this at home. <laughs> uh, and basically we're wondering how do children and the context for children figure into the housing choice decision? Because much of the, there, there are two really things that motivate moving to opportunity. Getting families into places where they might work, that was really the first thing. And, or that, why they, let me say that, well, the, I, yes, the policymakers' assumption is get them to places they might work. We all know that actually families that are receiving assistance are often also working. So we know what we know and policymakers were wanting to get them in the, in the labor market that was, I guess, above ground and their only source of um, income. And the second <coughs> focus of much of the housing research is about getting better context for children. Um, and so we are focusing on how do children in the context for children figure into the housing choice decision. And what did, well, basically what we did is we talked about this in these focus groups for probably two hours for each focus group. And later, and I'm still in the process of going through all the qualitative data, so I won't give you the juicy stuff here. I hope you all didn't come because I'm such a great ethnographer because here you're not getting much uh, of the people's words. Um, so what, what we found, number one, is most people were talking about transportation. So we were interested in kids, and most people were interested in transportation. They didn't want to move far out. They didn't want to move to many of the places with low poverty because you can't get there. They can't get to where they need to get. Uh, so public transportation was huge. A lot of the, that's what I mean by transportation, public transportation, access to public transportation. A lot of folks didn't have cars. And then all together, safety, affordability, and safety, I would argue, is child relevant, of course. Many people are thinking about their own safety and their children's safety. Affordability, uh, this is on the obstacle side. One of the obstacles for making any kind of, um, I would argue, move that people thought was even more desirable were the administrative hur hurdles of having a voucher. The voucher expires in 180 days. And so for families who are working and who have kids and have many responsibilities, getting days off from work to look at a number of apartments and to do the research can take more sometimes than six months to put this together. And what many people uh, said was their voucher was about to run out and that's when somebody said, there's an apartment in my neighborhood, and they took it, even if that wasn't what they were really looking for. Uh, 